Jesus. And we do. We welcome you in if you're watching our prayer meeting and uh, participating with us this evening. We're glad to have you. Glad to have a great crowd here full of Chick-fil-A and, uh, and, and, and good spirits. So uh, we're glad to have you with us. And uh, we're going to start off with a word of prayer before we take a look at the folks and situations on our prayer list. Lord God, we thank you, Father, for today. And again, Lord, we thank you for uh, taking care of us, uh, for guiding us and directing us through our business meeting, uh, for our monthly business meeting that we just got out of. Father God, we thank you for the time we can come together now and pray with one another, to pray to our God who loves us and who wants to hear from us, who wants to know uh, what we're dealing with, what, uh, who we're lifting up, and Father, who we're, we're praying for and caring for, and Father, trusting you to care for. So Lord God, would you help us, Father, grow our hearts more and more to know that, that you have given us a great power and a great opportunity and a great responsibility to pray for those who suffer, to pray for those who are, are struggling, and God, also to pray in celebration for those who uh, great things and great blessings are happening for. Father, above all, help us to remember to pray for the lost, Lord, that they might be able to come uh, through your showing them who you are to faith in Jesus. Lord God, would you help us to be a part of that in every way. Be with us now as we discuss and as we pray for those on our prayer list and, and more. Father, all to your glory, and we trust you to work your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you'll take a look at your prayer list there, we've got lots of, uh, lots of updates from last week and uh, looking for um, anything that you might have. Uh, continuing to pray for Bentley Wells um, as he, they continue, their family continues to try to get him the right medication and the right treatment. Uh, thankfully, he's, he's been really fighting hard and, and doing a lot better in some areas, uh, but still got a pretty good hill to climb there with his health. Uh, then also, uh, Ms. Vicki told us about, uh, about Sherry and Barney Smith, who are dealing with COVID uh, and in the hospital. Barney's still home. He's doing better, and they moved Sherry to a regular Good. Oh, good. Okay. Very good. So we're glad to hear that. So Barney's at home, and Sherry's in a regular room. All right. Thank you. If you know of anybody that's been in the hospital with COVID, getting moved to a regular room is usually a pretty good sign. So that's, uh, that's very good. Um, several families that we're praying for in the loss of, of loved ones, uh, the Donald Moorhead family, as well as the Lacey Tadlock family. And, of course, the Lacey Tadlock family involves Randy and Agnes. Um, and uh, we want to continue to, uh, to, to pray for them and their families as well. Um, so, uh, you know, our hearts break when we hear news like that, especially in some of the circumstances that it happens. Uh, I don't know if, there, if it's better, if it's a surprise, or if it's a long draw. I don't know. Uh, there's, there's no way to say that. Uh, we just want to continue to lift up the families that have lost loved ones um, here recently. Um, and uh, still continue to pray for Ms. Bobby Godby as, she, uh, as she's dealing with her uh, with some health issues there. And uh, as of uh, last week, she was at home. Ms. Noreen, have you heard anything more recently? Okay, I've not heard either, so we want to pray for Ms. Bobby. Um, how about how about Larry? I oh. thought she was in the hospital and might come home this Monday, but I haven't heard from her sister. Okay, that might. Well, because my notes. She was supposed to come home last Friday, but there was a test they needed to do, some sort of biopsy on her pancreas that couldn't be done, to, you know, until Monday. Okay. So I so haven't heard since then. I got you. Okay, we'll check on Miss Guy, Miss Guy, Miss <laughs> Miss Bobby, and see uh, what we can find out. Bless her heart. She's she's had a lot a lot of back and forth going on. I'm sure she probably herself is having a hard time keeping up with all of it going on. So, uh, how about Larry Lou? How's everything? Okay. okay. All right. Um, then we have uh, Grace Shivers, who was dealing with COVID. Miss Anita, how's how's Grace doing? Good, good, good. Is she recovering well then? Very good, very good. You take my name off. I had my second eye surgery today. So don't don't think you're going to sneak anything past Miss Helen. She can see you from across the field now. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say it tomorrow before I know for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're so glad that you're doing well and that they got you taken care of. That means she's going to be able to spot the deals at the stores, and so she'll be a shopping machine uh, getting after it there. So. 
uh, continue to pray for Miss Charlotte Tenen, and um, she uh, she would need to continue to pray because again she's also like Miss Bobby been dealing with quite a few health issues and uh, dealing with doctor's appointments and all kinds of other things. Just a lot of a lot of things going on in Miss Charlotte's life, especially here lately. Uh, and then also John Walton, uh, Miss Carolyn, any update uh, there? Okay, and he of course is dealing with um, COVID and its complications. So, but thankfully he is improving. All right, we're glad to have Will with us. Constantly praying for Grayson and Sarah, and, and for Oakley, and for Will. Uh, but he's doing great, and glad to have him in the house with us more and more these days. So, um, if uh, if I can sell rides in the rocker back there, I will. Uh, we'll, we'll give you some. You know, we'll sell a ticket or two, and Grayson will rock you to sleep, too. So. All right. What about you this evening? Who are some folks that we can add to start to pray for or any other updates or additions? I had a, a friend of mine who had a 26-week baby. Uh, baby's doing fine. His name's Callum. C-A-L-L-U-M. Uh, Dryden. Uh, he's making good progress. That is Callum the baby? Or? Callum the baby. Okay. Yeah. We will definitely lift them up. That's, uh, they said he's doing, doing well, just working through the development there in the NICU. Praise the Lord for, for good NICUs and the folks that work in them. That's for sure. You can take Teresa Melton off. Okay. She's supposed to go home tomorrow. Okay. She's still got issues. Okay. Much, much better, so she's All right. Miss Jan, how's Randy doing? He's not good. He's quitting on injury. Has he? I'm sorry to hear that. We'll definitely be praying for him and for y'all. All right. Any other updates or additions? Okay. <coughs> so they, uh, Brian said Sunday. I was glad to see him. He said they they were over there. So so glad that they started those treatments and praying those are going to be effective and uh, and take care of her. All right. If there's no more updates or additions, if you will, if you're watching at home, if you'd like to take a moment and pray with us and pray for those who the Lord puts on your heart. And if you're here in our sanctuary, if you will, just, just uh, circle up, get close to somebody or somebody's, and take just a moment to pray for those that the Lord puts on your heart specifically.
Lord God, again, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to speak directly to you. We don't need any other intermediary other than Christ who has died on the cross for our sins and made a way for us to have an open and dynamic relationship with you. And Father, we thank you that prayer is such a big part of that. Lord God, we do lift up all of those that we've mentioned, all those that are listed on our prayer list. Lord God, we also lift up the ones that we don't know about, the ones that are struggling silently. Father, the ones that may even feel like they're alone. Lord, I pray that you would be with them, that you would help them, that you would let them know that they are not alone, that they are never alone, especially once they put their faith in Jesus Christ and have that relationship with you. Lord God, would you help each person? Lord, would you work your will as only you can? For Father, you know best. Even though we would write it one way, Father, your way is better. We sing that from time to time on Sunday mornings here lately, that it's so much better your way. Father God, we pray your way in each of our lives. Lord God, be with those that are hurting. Be with those whose hearts are broken. Be with those who are fearful, who are struggling, wondering what's going to happen next, wondering why things are happening to them. Lord God, would you wrap your loving arms around them and around us, Father, that we might trust you more and more and lean on you more and more in everything that we go through, good, bad, even the, the mundane things. Lord God, we thank you for your word that teaches us more of how we can trust you and how faithful and trustworthy you are. Lord God, speak to us and encourage us this evening in these next few moments. Father God, that you would give us what we need to go from this place and to serve you, share your gospel with everyone we meet by what we say by how we how we live our lives. All for your glory and all that they might come to know you through Jesus. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, folks, we, uh, we started the Storms Sermon Series um, this past Sunday morning. This, uh, this coming Sunday, Lord willing, we will uh, talk about the issue, the storm of depression. Um, and as we, as we prefaced in the message this past Sunday, uh, there obviously, the depression is, is such a thing that there is a clinical, there are several clinical diagnoses of, of depression, lots of different forms of it that, uh, that certainly are beyond uh, just saying, hey, just, uh, you know, cheer up. You know, it's, it's, it's so much more than that. It is a true storm that many, many people face, many more than we'll ever know. Um, and, and so on Wednesday nights during this time of this sermon series, the Storm Sermon Series, uh, we want to kind of look as we usually do on Wednesday nights and see just kind of another supporting passage uh, in that theme so that God can continue to work in our hearts. Um, in, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus is teaching his disciples uh, and he's teaching them all kinds of things. He is teaching them, uh, I mean, just, just uh, he, he's teaching a lot of different concepts, a lot of different truths, a lot of different lessons. Um, he's, he's pronouncing woe upon the towns that he's ministered in physically. And he said such things as, man, if, you're, uh, if, if the miracles that have been performed in you would have been performed in, and then he lists out several wicked cities that had been known for their wickedness, and even some wiped off the face of the earth because of their wickedness. He said, if, you, if the miracles that had been performed in these cities had been performed in those cities, they would have repented. And so he, said, he, he pronounces woe upon those those other cities that he's ministered in because they did not repent. They did not believe. They had Jesus in the flesh right there before their very eyes, walking their streets, working in the people's lives, saving people's lives, changing people's lives, and yet so many just were there for the show. So many were there and didn't, didn't get it. Um, so many more came to him with, with heavy hearts. And so at the end of chapter 11, he, uh, he's going to tell us uh, about some of that. He's going to talk to us about uh, how he is there. He's not only there for us. We need to make sure we understand that. Jesus does not exist just to make us feel better or to comfort us, right? That's not the purpose for his existence. That's not the purpose for God the Father's existence. He is not just simply there to help or even to save us. That would be a very person or man-centered way of looking at God. And that is not a biblical way of looking at God. Um, that would make him less than God. But what's so amazing about God is he does not need us. He is there for his own glory and he is the only one in all of creation 
who can say that he is able to seek his own glory without being conceited. Why? Because he's the creator. <laughs> he owns us all. He owns it all, everything that is. Um, and so he is out for his own glory that he and only he deserves. But what's so amazing is that in his glorification, he chooses to concern himself with us. And so we have to make sure as believers in Christ, we have to make sure as disciples that we are, we're not thinking that God's just sitting there in heaven waiting to grant us our every wish. That's not at all what he's doing. Rather, he's there to save us from ourselves and in that to change us and to grow us so that the things we wish for will be transformed and grown to look more and more like what he desires that glorifies him. And with that thought in mind, we read in Matthew chapter 11, uh, in starting in verse 25. This is Jesus. It says that this time, or that time Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light." Beginning in verse 25, this, this comes on the tail end of him pronouncing woe upon these other cities. And what Jesus is pointing out here is, is that God has made things so simple. He has made them so straightforward that the, that the wise overlook them. The wise in this world have a hard time grasping the simplicity of the message of God, the gospel. We think if, we've, if we seem to be wise in the ways of the world, we think that there's got to be more to it than that. There's no way that this holy God would just let me off the hook for being unholy just because he loves me. I, I probably need to uh, do more. I probably need to, uh, you know, I, I need to be more. I need to be about this or I need to try harder there. I need to do this and do that. Uh, it can't be that simple. What Jesus is saying is it is that simple. It's so simple that it confounds, it confuses the wise, so to speak. He says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise. Does that mean that God has kept them from being able to see it? No. It's he's, he has presented it in such a simple way that our own so-called wisdom blocks us from being able to see it. You say, well, that's not really fair. Well, no, it's absolutely fair. What's one of the first things, what is the first thing we have to do if we're to come to faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ? We have to humble ourselves. Or we have to be humbled. One of the two. Sometimes God leads us to humble ourselves uh, after his gentle nudge. Sometimes he humbles us with a much more than gentle nudge. With a blow that knocks us down. And in our humility then, we're able to give our life over to him from rock bottom. Because we know it's not something we're going to do. It's not something we're going to earn. It's not something we're going to achieve. It's something we're going to realize finally and for all of eternity that we can't do it on our own. But to us, man, we think that there's better ways. He says, he says I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Does that mean that only little kids can be saved? No. It is simply a way in that we look at one another and look at ourselves and look at God. What's the thing about a child? Why, why, why little children? Why does Jesus use that example? How does a little child see the world? Well, there, you know, if we want to talk theologically, uh, technically, none of us, even as little children, are truly innocent. We're sinful even then. And that's just what scripture teaches us there's no getting away from that but certainly in the ways of the world when it comes to being you know uh, understanding what the world is like a child does look at the world very innocently 
They don't know all of what's going on. They don't know the ulterior, you know, ulterior motives. They don't know the, the, the prejudices. They don't know the, the, the hurt and all these things. They just look at the world and it's just something for them to behold. Uh, it's something for them to take in. And it's very simple for them. It takes time, sadly, for us to learn as little children what the world, quote unquote, is really like. And we get our eyes open to the evil of it. We get our eyes open to the deception of it. We get our eyes open to the cruelty of it. Uh, but a child looks at the world and, and man, it's just wide open. It's that simple. Um, and so Jesus says that it's people who look at God in that way. God's made very plain, very simple what the gospel is, what needs to happen. He had made it plain and simple to those cities that did not repent. And that's what Jesus is saying is you guys had so much, you thought you knew so much, but yet you missed it because you're trying to act like more than you are and not humble yourselves or allow yourselves to be humbled and be able to come to understand and to grasp the message of God, to repent, to put your faith even in Jesus himself to believe in God the Father and have a relationship with him and be forgiven of their sins. He says it, it was to God's pleasure that he hid those from the wise. I think this is a reminder to us that we don't figure God out, right? No one comes to know Jesus because they intellectually got it all figured out and said, you know what? Yep, I get that. I'll go with that. That's not biblical salvation. That's a head knowledge not a heart knowledge, as they say. We don't reason our way to God. We don't work our way to God. We don't earn our way to God. Rather, we submit. And that's what he's called us to do. As we grow to be adults, we learn how to be more and more independent. What do children have to do because of their size, their level of strength, their level of ability uh, to take care of themselves, they have to submit to their parents, to the authorities, to the people around their teachers, their, you know, all, all the people that have more power over them. And it's simpler for them. They don't have a choice, do they? They can rebel, of course, and we do. Uh, but, but as far as there's not going to be a, a three-year-old overpower a full-grown adult, right? Uh, that doesn't happen. They have to submit. Because the adult is physically stronger. Well, God is so much stronger than we could ever be. And we need to submit as well. And it seems like it's hidden. It's put on full display. It's not hidden in that way. What hides it from us is our own learnedness, our own so-called wisdom. He says, yes, Father, in verse 26, for this is what you were pleased to do. The simplicity of the gospel and the simplicity of a person of any age surrendering their life to him in faith in Jesus Christ pleases God. It glorifies him to the highest because one more person has received eternal life, has joined into the kingdom, has been admitted and adopted into the family of God, and is now part of glorifying him all the more. Jesus then goes in verse 27, he says, All things have been committed to me by my Father. And this is another one of the statements of Jesus that equates him with God. Now, this got him in a lot of trouble with his Jewish hearers because that was a huge no-no. You didn't put yourself on the same level as God. That would have been blasphemy to them. But he is speaking what is true. He's not just another man. He's not just another rabbi. He's not just another teacher. He is the Son of God. He is God with us in the flesh. He is Emmanuel. That's who he is. And so when he says, all things have been committed to me by my Father, it's not blasphemous. It's the truth. He says, no one knows the Son except the Father. Because the people he's talking to, even his disciples, don't understand him. But the heavenly, our Heavenly Father, his Heavenly Father, God the Father, fully knows him. He says, and no one knows the Father except the Son. He says, I also know him. They are in relationship. Why? Why is that important? Because remember, one of the things, not the only thing, but one of the things that Jesus accomplished in taking on flesh, in walking in, in, on the streets of these towns and in the countrysides and by, by the side of the disciples and his followers and the people that would encounter him, one of the things he did for them and for us is to provide a living, breathing example of how to have a relationship with God. 
And so it makes perfect sense then that he would be in relationship as the Son of God with the Father to show us what a relationship with God would look like. He says that no one knows the Father except the Son. They're in perfect relationship. And he adds, he says, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. What's another thing Jesus did in the flesh? He came to teach us. He came to show us. He came to reveal who God is and how to know him. He came to reveal it to a lot of people who had already thought they'd figured out how to know him because they were experts in the law. But God wasn't finished when he used the law. He finished it in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is the one who continued to reveal the Father to those who would come to know him. Verses 28, 29, and 30 speak a little bit more directly to that idea of anxiety. Also speak to the depression that we'll talk about this coming week. Um, it says in verse 28, he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Y'all know how it feels at the end of a long, hard-working day, right? Believe it or not, I know that feeling too, right? Uh, I know, shocker. Uh, but you know, you get home and your body is tired, your mind is tired, your heart is tired. You've put your blood, sweat, and tears. You've put your, your physical strength, your emotional strength, your, uh, you know, your, your, your loving strength into uh, the day. And at the end of the day, you, you come in and, and you just fall down wherever you are. You, know, you, you fall into your chair. You fall into your couch. You fall onto your bed. You fall into the bathtub, where, you know, wherever you might fall. You just fall. You know that feeling when you finally get to sit down, lay down, and exhale? Man, that's good rest, isn't it? And for as long as you get to sit there, usually it's a good five, ten seconds, right, before we have to do something else. Uh, but, but for as long as you get to sit there, lay there, soak there, whatever you're doing, and you understand the value of rest, don't we? Um, that rest is not even close. As good as that rest is, that's not even close to the rest that Jesus is talking about that we find in him. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Weary and burdened by what? Physical labor? Nah. Emotional labor? Eh, maybe. Spiritual labor. What we don't always realize, what we don't always understand is, is that there is, a, there is a realm of things going on that is spiritual that we don't always see. It always affects us. It's always going on in our lives, and it always has been. Um, we don't always recognize it. But there is a spiritual battle going on in us and over us every single moment of every single day in our life. And that takes a toll on us. Some of the things we deal with are because of the spiritual warfare that's going on around us. Now we can romanticize that a lot and talk about angels and demons and all the, you know, that type of imagery. And that's all true. But the bottom line of it is, is that spiritual warfare wears us out from the very core of who we are. And we don't even realize it. It's going on, and it has that effect on us. And he says, come to him, all you who are weary and burdened, burdened and weary by that spiritual warfare. He's saying, look, come to me, and I will secure you in the midst of that spiritual warfare. I will rescue you. I will save you. I will bring you victory in that spiritual warfare. The warfare will still go on, and it will still tire us out. But we will never be defeated by it once we put our faith in Jesus Christ. He says, I will give you rest. You know, the funny thing about that moment of rest after that long day of work is, you know, you get up the next morning and what do you do? You probably go back to work just as hard again, uh, maybe harder, maybe not quite as hard. But, you know, there's a possibility of getting back in. Uh, when we get the rest from Jesus, it is eternal. It is forever. It is constant. It is continuous. Is sufficient. He says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. In verse 29, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. To take a yoke on is, is, an, you know, is, is a term dealing with, uh, with oxen or livestock, pulling a plow, right? That yoke is what, is, is what goes across them to pull that farm implement behind them. So the yoke would not be something that would be thought of as easy. It would be something that you needed something stronger to put that on. And then they, the, you know, those oxen, those cattle, those horses, whatever it was, those mules would use all of their strength in, you know, care, pulling on that yoke. That yoke would be heavy on them, 
right? And if we had to be the one pulling the plow, it'd be heavy on us. But he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Isn't that true about Jesus? Does he have to be gentle? No, he's God. Does he have to be humble? No, he's God. He chooses to be that way. He chooses to be that way because that's how he, I mean, that's what he knows is what we need to see and experience. He chooses to be that way. He doesn't have to. He wants to. And he offers that gentleness. He says, take my yoke upon you. Different from the yoke of the world. Different from the yoke of anxiety. Different from the yoke of depression. Different from the yoke of failure. Different from the yoke of loss and death. And all those other yokes that we seem to want to take on. All the responsibilities that we have to fulfill and all the things we have to do and accomplish. All those yokes are heavy. He says instead, take on my yoke. Take my yoke upon you uh, and learn from him. Learn a new way. Don't just chase after the old way. He says, and you will find rest for your souls. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This Wednesday evening, you may find yourself weary, burdened. I think Jesus would ask us all the question, what yoke have you got on you? Whose yoke do you have on you? Do you have yours? Do you have your families? Do you have your friends? Do you have your businesses? Do you have your churches? Or have you taken the yoke of Jesus upon you? Because all those other yokes will wear you out beyond what you can do. But only the yoke of Jesus will give you rest. As we learn from him, as we learn in him, as we submit our lives to him, live in the salvation that only he can give, do we see what that rest is like? If you're struggling tonight, if you're watching at home and you're struggling, what yoke have you taken on or what yokes have you taken on? Would you tonight, wherever you may be, here in our sanctuary, at home, whatever you may be doing, would you take on the yoke of Jesus? Would you submit to that? Would you let him be the one who brings you that rest and try to, instead of trying to find it for yourself. If so, he'll save you right now, tonight, without any further ado, <laughs> without any other necessary complications or performances or accomplishments, he'll save you. Would you take on his yoke tonight? For those of us that have, I hope and pray that we are living in that rest. Doesn't mean that we don't work. Doesn't mean that we don't get tired. Doesn't mean that that spiritual warfare is not still going on around us, but we're secured in it. We're secured in the midst of it. We're secured from it. We have the victory. Are we living that way? Let's be sure that we are. All to the glory of Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Lord God, we thank you, Father, that you invite us to know you through faith in Jesus. That his life, death, and resurrection have made all of that possible. We don't have to sacrifice. We don't have to do anything to earn or to qualify for your love or your forgiveness. Lord, let us take on the yoke of Jesus. Let us learn from him a new way, a way that's not about us earning it, but a way that's about us surrendering all that we are to all that you are so that we can find and have all that you offer, including salvation. Lord God, tonight, would you help those who do not know you come to know you, put their faith in Jesus and be saved. Lord, we celebrate with you as you do that. For those that are saved, would you strengthen us, Lord, that we might live that way, that we might not get caught up in the ways of other yokes, of other ideas, of other things, and, and, and make ourselves weary and burdened when you have desired and have indeed given us rest. Lord God, let us live a life that reflects what you've done in our hearts. And Father, shows that you are the one that we need. And let's others see it and bring, them, bring themselves to the point to surrender to you as well. Lord, go with us. Help us to serve this community. Help those that are hurting and help us to do the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.